on va commencer avec notre premier, notre premier conférencier, qui est le docteur Laurent Legault, qui est un, un pédiatre, un endocrinologue pédiatrique. Donc, le docteur Legault, il est chef de la clinique du diabète et du centre pédiatrique de la pompe à l'insuline à l'Hôpital Montréal pour enfants, qui est le, qui est le centre universitaire de l'Université McGill. Alors, il est le professeur adjoint au département de pédiatrie de l'Université McGill. Alors, docteur Legault, vous allez nous brosser un tableau de ce que l'on doit comprendre au niveau de, des traitements, je dirais, traditionnels au niveau du diabète de type 1. So, Dr. Legault will now present what we call traditional treatments for diabetes type 1. Thank you. Uh, it's nice to see uh, such a large number of people uh, for type 1 diabetes. I'm not used to that. Um, so, uh, my role is not to talk about the future but the present. Uh, my two colleagues will be talking more about future treatments. I'm going to focus on what's been done historically uh, because diabetes is a disease that's been known for uh, thousands of years. Uh, initially, the diagnosis was made by looking at the urine and tasting it. That's uh, something that uh, we medical students learn uh, quite early. And you could actually see the crystals of sugar in the urine, so that's what this physician in the Middle Ages is, is doing. Uh, and the diabetes type 1 is a Canadian story, as you might know, uh, in about 90 years ago, uh, the Frederick Banting, a surgeon, <laughs> uh, purified and isolated his insulin uh, initially from dogs and did the first clinical treatment with, uh, with insulin in the 20s and had the Nobel Prize for it. So traditionally, people who don't have uh, type 1 diabetes uh, will secrete insulin based on what's going on in their daily life. So what you when you have a meal, whether it's large or, or not so large, the insulin will be in keeping with the amount of sugar that you absorb. And if you do exercise, that's the symbol of the bike over there, but it could be any kind of exercise, your insulin will actually be lowered to avoid you falling into low blood sugar or hypoglycemia as we refer to it as physicians. So when, once we uh, had insulin that we could actually use in patients, we tried to mimic what physiology is actually doing in, in individuals with, without diabetes. So initially people were uh, treated with three uh, insulins a day, and, and you see that there's a fair amount of coverage for uh, all day, but there are spots where sometimes you may have too much insulin in the afternoon, for instance, or, or too little insulin at the end of the night and that led to uh, situations where your blood sugar is too high or too low, and it's pretty good because it made you survive, but it didn't necessarily reach the goal of get, getting perfect blood sugar control. So when new insulins appeared on the market, uh, a lot of people moved to what we call the multiple daily injections, which is four insulin injections per day, and, and again, you see that there's a pretty good coverage, but there are areas where there seems to be no insulin on board, and, and you wonder about how much insulin is required overnight while you're sleeping, because you still need insulin, even if you're not eating, just a little bit, but enough to keep your blood sugar from rising. So, pump, uh, the pump arrived on the market, and, and people tried the pump initially, and everybody thinks that the pump is actually new technology, but this is a model from the 60s, and you can see that uh, people tried their luck with uh, the device that was not so portable, I must admit, uh, and it was a bit cumbersome. Uh, but, you know, it, it was the first prototype. If you, some of you may remember the first computers and the first calculators, they're all big and cumbersome, but eventually they get to be smaller. And that's what happened to the pumps. Uh, they became smaller, they, become, they became much more efficient. Uh, and, and so different models are on the market, and I'm just displaying what uh, is uh, on the market cur currently. Uh, and what the, the pump allows you to do is to program different uh, times where you want more insulin or less insulin, depending on how active you are, how much in, uh, food you, you take, and at what time you're actually taking that food. So you can program what we call boluses, which is delivery of insulin. 
and uh, it, it's attached to your body, and it's usually uh, placed on the abdominal area, but you can actually put it on at other sites. And it's attached to you by a little tubing, and you can disconnect from it when you're taking a shower, for instance, or you're going for a swim, but you can't disconnect for a long period. So the advantages of the pump is that it's very flexible because whenever you have a meal, you can program a bolus for it and you can give yourself some insulin. And it then can make your blood sugar probably more closer to the targets that you're setting for yourself so that you get better A1C, which is what the clinicians use as a means of telling whether most of your blood sugar are in the right uh, area for, for your health. So hypoglycemia risk is reduced because you can actually uh, tailor your insulin regimen to avoid those dips that were not so easy to do with injections. And, uh, whoops, too, too fast. And so you have less injections that you can actually, you change a catheter site typically every two or three days, whereas, as I mentioned previously, you would have about four injections for the majority of people who have type, uh, type 1 diabetes. So you're going from four a day to one every two or three days. So a lot of people are usually quite happy about that. Disadvantages, though, is that you need to do much more blood testing to set up the pump, at least initially and even after, because it's running through the night and you want to avoid having to deal with hypoglycemia while you're sleeping, because while you're sleeping, you don't perceive the risk of your low blood sugar. You don't have a warning sign like most people typically would have during the daytime. So there is a risk because you're dealing with T-tubing that there would be an obstruction in the system so the insulin is not actually delivered as you thought it would be. And so uh, there are some uh, risks that, that, that you run out of insulin because of the blockage in the tubing. And as I mentioned earlier, if you have uh, uh, to disconnect, you have to remember to reconnect because that's your lifeline. That's where your insulin is given. So if you're not connected, then for a while you run out of insulin and you may end up with what we call ketosis. And, and every decision that's made on the pump is actually uh, thought and, and actually uh, made by the, by the person who uh, is obviously trained to do so, but you have to enter your programming manually in the pump. So that's something that's, that's somewhat frustrating in this day and age because we have a technology that perhaps could help us uh, bypass that. So another technology that arrived on the market about 10 plus years ago is a sensor. Uh, some of you might be familiar with that. It's a, it's a device that measures blood sugar every five minutes for a period that lasts from anywhere from three days to six days. It's quite discreet. Uh, and it, uh, it, it will then uh, give you readings much more frequently than you would probably do by doing your finger pokes. And so it's attached also to your body and, uh, in, uh, and it gives you readings that will probably tell you what's going on in between the regular blood test that most people would do before meals or before bedtime. So for instance, uh, if you, uh, dark points here are, are where the person would do a blood sugar reading through a finger poke on their finger. And, and so this is the reading they have, this is the reading they have, this is the reading they have before bedtime. And you see that there were no recordings during the night. And all through the night, the blood sugar was low, but the patient slept right through it. So that will give you some, you know, some information about what's going on really. Uh, another example would be that uh, you have this information, and you have this information, so you think the blood sugar is quite steady, but it, in fact, it's rising quite a bit in between those two points. So you're missing part of the information, and that gives you quite uh, a new picture on, on what's really going on. So it, it's, uh, it's again an example of those peaks and, and, and troughs that you might be seeing uh, in, in patients who are hooked up to this device, and, and this person has m measured four times, which is actually what we recommend for most of our patients, but we're missing this particular high uh, peak that, that uh, is recorded by the device. <coughs> so those are two interesting technologies, and, and what the next step was is that the sensor that reads those blood sugar now sends signals to the pump to tell the pump what the actual blood sugar levels are. So. 
that's quite interesting, but the problem that we were facing then is that the pump is not intelligent enough to do anything with the information. So you do get the information from the sensor, but at the other end, the pump is just recording it. So that's kind of illustrating what happens is the device is sending information to the pump and the patient is hooked up to the two machines at the same time. So the combining of the technology has been studied in clinical settings with patients and what we have been seeing is even if people were wearing this every single day uh, and, and paying attention to those numbers, uh, only about, a, whoa, wrong button, a quarter of them only achieved the, the, you know, the ideal blood sugar that people were expecting. So when you're not achieving perfect blood sugar, then it means that you're spending a fair amount of time in hyperglycemia, high blood sugars, or hypoglycemia, low blood sugars. So people always ask us, what about the transplants? What about getting the cells that are actually manufacturing uh, the insulin and, and transplanting them in someone who is not making <coughs> them. So uh, that's actually something that is doable. The problem is that there are two approaches that you would be looking at. One is transplanting the whole pancreas. The problem with that is that there are not that many pancreases available for all the patients who have uh, this condition. And usually what's being done in the clinical setting is that you combine it with a kidney transplant when someone has reached the stage, unfortunately, where the kidneys are also no longer functioning. So that's what most people are doing at this point in time with pancreases. The second step is to try to isolate the cells that are producing insulin, which we call islets, and those are isolated from pancreases that are um, that are uh, you know, extracted from donors, and what you do is you harvest as much islets as you can, and you uh, will, uh, uh, and then over the last 20 years, people have looked at solutions, try to get those islets to survive in an individual, and for the last 20 years, so far, no one has really found a recipe that will allow those cells to survive long enough to keep some people out uh, uh, off of insulin. So just, illustrated what people do then is you take a, a pancreas from a donor, you isolate the cells that are producing insulin from it, you put them in a, uh, you know, you just blend them, purify them, and mix them, and then they are transplanted into a patient's uh, bloodstream, and then you see what happens in terms of the, um, of the insulin requirements that these people would have. You would be expecting someone then to no longer require insulin if that were to be successful. So a few years ago, you might have heard about the Edmonton Protocol. Uh, a group in Edmonton found a way to basically uh, have people get transplants of islets, and the um, anti-rejection medication that they had to take was very much tolerable, because you're getting islets from a um, from, from someone who's not yourself. So it's, it's, it's a tissue that's considered to be foreign to you and the normal reaction of the body is to try to eliminate it. So you need anti-rejection medication like any other transplant. And the problem is these medications tend to be, to be toxic. So what happens is that they found a protocol that, that was able to provide anti-rejection medications that the people were tolerating very well. The problem is that now we have several years of follow-up and I just want to focus on this slide where you see that after about four years, 90% uh, of patients who received islet transplants were back on insulin. So they were no longer able to uh, stop the insulin, which was the goal of the whole process. And, and so that's, that unfortunately technology now is no longer very exciting and a lot of people are thinking that this is no, not necessarily going to be the solution for, for the situation. So there, there have been significant advances since the discovery 90 years ago of insulin, but none have been able to re reproduce a normal delivery of insulin uh, as you would be hoping that you achieve. And God knows people have tried different schemes, but for the time being we're not really at the point where we can say we can have perfect control with all the technologies that we've had. And of course, research is ongoing, and you'll hear about it in a few minutes uh, to resolve this challenging problem. 
And just I'm going to finish up with uh, just a, you know we we're going to have someone interviewed in a couple of minutes. But the last uh, in the last uh, ma magazine by the CDA, the Canadian Diabetes Association, came out a couple of weeks ago, and uh, Canadian actor Victor Garber made the front page, and and so he's a diabetic, and he's um, you know he's quoted uh, in the in the magazine saying. I have days when I think I'm doing everything right, but no matter what I do, my blood sugar won't come down. I really understand why there is a connection between diabetes and depression. So bright individuals who actually do a lot of work to try to make this the best they can, they're challenged and they're having a hard time doing it. So uh, yes, we've made several advancements, but you know, you'll hear about the possibilities that we can potentially offer in the near future. Thank you.